Um, so I think for time's sake, we can probably just keep going. Um, we were, Ian and I were gonna introduce ourselves, but you guys have already met us um, and Tuli did a good job introducing us. So we'll have the first um, presenter present. So go ahead, Ian, you can introduce that. Um, okay, hello guys. Uh, we're gonna kick it off just like we did with the round tables and um, we're going to allow the mentor or the overseer to give a brief introduction to the student, um, about a one minute or so introduction. And then we'll kick it off with the 10 minute presentation with five minutes afterwards. And um, we're gonna have Sana go first. Okay, uh, hi. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hamza Yazdani. Uh, Dr. Tommy and I have been Sana's mentor throughout this program. And for the greater part of the year, um, Sana came to our lab through the Hillman Academy in 2018 and uh, rejoined us as an undergraduate at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, since 2018, Sana participated in uh, multiple scientific projects. He has also mastered important experimental skills um, required for her to finish those projects. Uh, she's also managed to publish multiple scientific papers. Um, she presented uh, at several meetings and is applauded, uh, well applauded by her mentors. She has recently started to work on her own uh, project, which we are very excited about. Her main interest has been in investigating the role of surgery in inducing tissue injury and the effect of mitochondria on it, which is why our lab decided to award her with the title, The Lab Mitochondria. Um, we hope to see Sana continue her journey in science uh, as she applies for her med school in the next year or so. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Sana to share what she has been working on for the past few months. Um, Sana, anyway. Thanks, Hamza. Um, I'll share my presentation now. Is everyone able to see everything clearly? Yes. Okay. So hi everyone, I'm Sana Hondu. Um, as Hamza mentioned over this past summer, I've been working with uh, Dr. Tomei in his lab as well as Dr. Yazdani closely on uh, several individual projects. Specifically this project, we were looking at the protective effect that exercise can play in ischemia reperfusion injury and specifically how that relates into a transplant model. And I'll be sharing those findings with you all today. I'm having some trouble advancing the slides, sorry. Okay. So just to provide a brief background, um, so in liver disease, there are several stages. So firstly, we have a normal liver. And then as a liver disease can progress, we come to end stage liver disease. The current treatment options currently available are, there are numerous available. However, the major uh, and gold standard for treatment options is a liver transplantation. A major barrier to the transplantation success, however, is IR injury that occurs when the livers are clamped. What happens in this process is the hepatocytes or the liver cells become stressed and damaged and they undergo a metabolic reprogramming which shifts its normal metabolic functioning towards an aerobic glycolytic uh, process as well as the they start to release damps which are indicative of an inflammatory uh, environment specifically like hmgb1 and several histones in the case of liver disease. So it's clear that with an inflammatory pathway that there is going to be some possible graft rejection. So in order to remedy these issues, we need to look at possible ways to alleviate the IR injury. So previous literature, So in previous literature, 
there has been work looking into the role that exercise training can play on decreasing a, a systemic inflammation in the environment, specifically looking at muscle adipose tissue as well as endothelial and um, oh. immune cells. Uh, uh, there is a decrease in the pro-inflammatory cytokines and an increase in the anti-inflammatory cytokines. All of this to say that it encourages an anti-inflammatory environment. And other research also confers that there is sustainable protection from exercise from several solid organs. Our lab has shown that there is a significant amount of protection that exercise can play within the IR warm ischemia reperfusion injury with a decrease in hepatic cell death and an increase in the inflammatory response. What we are looking at finding is what is the possible role that a moderate exercise training can provide to protect graft against both cold and warm ischemia in a transplant model. So to accomplish this, we have two groups of age-matched donor mice, a sedentary exercise training mouse. After their training period, we put them on one hour of cold storage and then transplanted those livers into a recipient mouse. These mice with now a grafted liver were then sacrificed after six hours of reperfusion. And then we then performed several tests to see what the levels of damage were inside of their uh, graft livers. So we harvested blood samples and used a serum analysis to assess the level of damage uh, in the serums themselves. So looking at ALT, AST, and LDH levels, we can see that sedentary, the sedentary group has significantly greater levels of damage as compared to the exercise training groups. And then this is further supported by our findings that in the sedentary mouse, there's greater levels of this necrotic area as opposed to an exercise group, which has lower levels of necrotic area. So these are prelim preliminary findings that help support the idea that exercise can provide a protective effect against uh, tissue and serum damage in the liver. So then now that we know that there's tissue damage, we want to see what is the environment looking like um, through several chemokines and cytokines. So to assess the inflammatory environment, we looked at several pro-inflammatory cytokines and two anti-inflammatory cytokines. As you can see, the sedentary group has an increased level of the pro-inflammatory cytokine and a decreased level of the anti-inflammatory cytokine. So essentially what this is showing is that the exercise training group is providing a more anti-inflammatory environment as opposed to the sedentary group. And this is also supported by looking at the chemokine levels um, in the livers. And you can see that, again, the sedentary group has greater levels of damage as opposed to the exercise training group. So as a, just a brief summary before we move on, both of these groups of findings help identify that exercise does provide some type of protection against the anti, in, against the pro-inflammatory pathways um, that result from injury. So then to assess how this uh, damage is happening, we looked at the levels of HMGB1. As I had mentioned earlier in my presentation, uh, HMGB1 is a damp released when there is injury uh, in the environment. So HMGB1 is just a marker for uh, whatever damage is happening inside of the liver. As you can see in the red, uh, there is greater levels of HMGB1 uh, in the uh, cold storage um, that is not co co-localized than compared to the uh, sedentary. So essentially we are seeing greater levels <clears throat> of 
uh, nuclear HMGB1. In this figure, it's kind of hard to see, but they're co-localized with the blue DAPI, which is a nuclear marker. So we're seeing that there's greater levels of HMGB1 being released in the sedentary as compared into the exercise cold storage. And so to suspect why this is happening, we looked at the levels of mitochondria. Uh, we looked at mitochondria because it's known that when my, that the mitochondria become dysfunctional and they release uh, reactive oxygen species, which are indicative of the inflammatory environment. So again, looking at the red markers, you can see that in the um, sedentary, there are greater, there are less uh, amounts of mitochondria as composed to the exercise, which have greater levels of mitochondria. So then <clears throat> cumulatively, if we consider all of these findings um, and we see that the exercise has provided um, a level of protection against the pro-inflammatory environment. We can further use these findings to create pharmacological targets that could promote these exercise training responses, um, and they'd be able to provide uh, protection against injury and inflammatory response in the case of transplantation. So just to wrap it up, I'd like to give a huge thank you uh, to Dr. David Boone and to Solomon Lipschitz for organizing this program. Um, I'd also like to thank the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation for sponsoring me this summer as an undergraduate and for supporting uh, the work of young scientists. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my lab, um, Dr. Yazani and Dr. Tome who are here. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to work in the lab and to be able to uh, learn so much that I'll definitely be able to use uh, in the future. So thank you all for listening to my presentation. I'll be answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sana. If anybody has any questions, now is the time to ask. We have a few minutes. I have a brief, I have a quick question for you, Sana. Um, have you looked at the differences in exercise training types, or do you predict that there would be a difference between potentially aerobic versus anaerobic exercise training? We haven't looked um, into that. That would de definitely be something to consider. Um, we had essentially just trained them um, on a treadmill, so moderate exercise, um, five days a week with a two day rest period in between, we thought that this would serve enough of a, um, a response in the environment um, after that four week training period. Uh, but that definitely be something to look into like whether uh, anaerobic responses have different outcomes. Yes, Sana, that was a, that was a great, um... That was a great presentation and very cool data. Um, so I, I so you, you I noticed that you put your animals on a treadmill um, inter, um, to train them. Has anybody or ha have you considered um, the differences between voluntary running versus treadmill running? For instance, because because some mice, if you just give them a wheel, they will run on their own for you know miles a day, whereas others won't. Um, they'll just sit around and watch Netflix instead. So have you um, have you considered what voluntary running versus involuntary running uh, might might um, how that might affect your system here? Yeah, I think that um, because they're on the treadmill and there's you know a shocker to help support their um, that they continuously run through that period, it is more of like involuntary running. Um, I think maybe like the reasoning behind why we wanted to see um, what the effect of just involuntary running, having them all undergo that same period of stress uh, during their exercise um, training, that could probably uh, operate as a means just to see what's happening in the environment. And then if we were to include more like social factors that people could have, like as far as whether or not they want to run, um, that could be something to look into in the future. But I think just for, you know, gathering just basic findings, I think that's why we chose involuntary, but definitely be something to look into. Thank you. Yeah. 
Great. Nice job. Okay. Any more questions? If not, we'll move on to our second presenter, which is Salome Martinez in the laboratory of Dr. Elak Jogwakar. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alok Joglikar, and my lab is at the Department of Immunology here at Pitt. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Salome uh, Martinez. Uh, Salome is our, uh, our lab's first Hillman um, Academy student, um, and uh, she has exceeded our expectations uh, by, by, by a lot. Um, she's currently in Frank Franklin Regional Senior High School. Uh, she's going to talk about her project, which involves looking at T-cell specificities in melanoma. And in the last two months in our lab, Salome has acquired uh, cloning superpowers. Uh, and so she's our lab's super cloner. So take it away, Salome. Thank you, Dr. Jaglakar, for that very um, fun introduction. Um, so I am now going to share my screen. Okay, so can you see my, my screen? All right. Okay, cool. So um, as Dr. Jiglokar said, my project consisted of variation in T cell clonality with um, bacteria and melanoma. Um, so now into some background. So TCRs um, distinguish T cells from each other. So this is relevant because this is going to be a big, big focus in my project are specifically the TCRs in the T cells, specifically CD8 T cells. So these are the effector uh, T cells. These are the T cells that attack uh, antigens or pathogens. So um, as you can see in the figure here to the right in steps uh, six and seven of the cancer immunity cycle, um, this applies also to any other kind of um, interaction with uh, a pathogen, but I thought this was good because I am looking into melanoma, but here the TCR is binding to this cancer cell. And so I think this does a good job of showing how this recognition of the pathogen then also triggers this release of antigens with the death of this cell. So how this is relevant is because my entire project is really focusing in on um, this kind of um, triggering of the antigens and antibodies and TCRs um, and how they're gonna affect the clonality of different T cells with specific TCRs. So now into some preliminary data, which was provided to me by uh, Marley Smeasel's uh, lab. So uh, the experiment consisted of B6 mice with a B16 melanoma line tumor. And these mice were split into two groups. So the two groups, um, one group was given a PBS control so this was just a placebo. And the second group was given an experimental bacteria. Um, so it was found, as you can see in the figures to the right, that the experimental mice had a higher uh, clonality. So clonality is just a proliferation of cells. So basically just there are more cells. So what this is trying to show is that per cell, so this cell is different from this cell, from this cell. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I'm trying to show with my cursor. Um, so this cell is different from this cell, from this cell. But the, the experimental mice, each cell had more division and they proliferated at a, at a much um, higher rate. And so what we want to figure out is why that happened. So uh, basically, the overall picture is that tumor and experimental T cells have uh, several antibodies uh, as a result of the antigens that are present. And so they have MHC, neo, and bacterial-derived antibodies. And so these are all things that could have triggered this higher clonality in the experimental mice. And so then later down the line, we will look at which one of these, or if it's going to be a combination of these, that generated this clonality. And this result is going to be what is going to be applicable in real world settings. 
So for the methodology, we had to split it into two. Um, so this is the first part. This has uh, five uh, major steps. So the first step, we I was given 23 TCR DNA fragments, and I had to take that and amplify it using PCR, which is kind of illustrated in this figure to the right. Um, and then when I had that, I could set it aside. And then in parallel to that step, I could digest a backbone, which is just a separate set of DNA and gel purify it to have that set of DNA and combine it in step three through infusion and transform that into a bacteria. Now it should be noted that this bacteria is different from the experimental bacteria used in the preliminary data. This bacteria is just a vector used to carry out this experiment. Um, then in step four, we do call any PCR to uh, proliferate these bacteria to um, get billions of, of copies of these bacteria and of this plasmid that we made with this uh, backbone and this TCR uh, fragment. And then once we have that, we mini prep to isolate the plasmid and sequence to make sure that we have the correct uh, DNA uh, fragment. So then now comes the reactivity part of the methods. Now, this is the very important part with the conclusion because this is what's gonna find out how the introduction of the bacteria affects the functionality and the behavior of the T cells and uh, why was that clonality affected? And is it tumor reactive? Is it tumor and bacteria cross reactive or is it just the result of there being um, another pathogen and it's just bacteria reactive? So in order to do this, we have to transfect um, phoenixes, which are just some uh, eukaryotic cells with the TCR plasmid that we got in the previous um, method. Um, then once we have that virus, we can transduce um, the some 4G4s, which is just another cell line um, with that TCR retrovirus. And then we can set up an assay because now we have some cells that can express this TCR and we can set them up against melanoma and we can set them up against this bacteria and figure out and get a conclusion. So now for some results. So we so far have results from the first part of the, of the uh, protocol. So this is the amplification of the TCRs. So to the left, you have a gel which shows correct um, base pairs of the, of the amplification. So it just confirmed that we got the fragment and we were able to uh, do this and we could continue on to the concentrations and we were able to um, get like eluded TCRs and the concentrations were good enough to the point to where we could use them in future steps in the infusion step. So same thing with the backbone. Um, when we looked at the gel, we had the correct um, size and we could then do the concentration. And we decided to combine all the tubes and we could do that since it was all the same DNA. And we ended up with 120 microliters at 47 nanograms per microliter. Um, and then this is the result of all of the colonies that we ended up um, taking from the plates. So I had to gel image 90 colonies that we ended up doing colony PCR on. So these are the ones that, the ones that are showing up are the ones that are positive colonies. So those are the ones that got 900 base pairs. And so therefore are positive colonies that had the TCR insert and we could proceed onto the next step with. Um, this is just a continuation of that um, with some more colonies. And then the NP TCR is just a control TCR. So the conclusion is that so far the TCR cloning protocol shows promise and the project should be continued and uh, reactivity assays should be pursued in order to arrive at an applicable conclusion because thus far um, I have only completed the first method and therefore this final conclusion that we want to arrive at has not um, happened yet, but we are on the right path and so 
this um, shows promise. So I wanna thank uh, UPMC Hillman Cancer Center, University of Pittsburgh for um, granting me this opportunity. Um, Dr. David Boone, uh, Solomon Lushitz, and obviously, you know, immunology department of um, University of Pittsburgh, ICI, Jogokar Lab, specifically my mentor, Dr. Um, Alok Jogokar. Um, my lab mentor, who has been overseeing my entire project and really helping me hands on, uh, Kobe Rankine, and just kind of helping me along the line with any questions I might have and any other kind of sort of little thing. Um, a big help has also been Paul Zidinak. So I definitely said that wrong, but you know, I, I tried. Uh, and then here are my sources that I use to help put this presentation together and give you the figures to illustrate some of my talking points. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Salome. Um, we have a couple minutes for a few questions if anybody has anything to say. Okay, no questions at this time, um, but if anybody thinks of something, you can put it into the chat and we can circle back to it. So we'll move on now to our, our, um, our third presenter. And this is Jenna, Jenna Trent. And um, she was the student in my lab. So I got to mentor her and technically we're in Dr. Tulia Bruno's lab, um, but Ayana and I, and also Cheryl, Got to work with Jenna. So I'll give a brief introduction and then she can get her slides up and ready to go. Um, so yes, this is Jenna's first, uh, first round with the um, Hillman Academy and she entered. Um, uh, this was also her really first time doing bench translational research. And she, she showed a tremendous spirit and drive to get in and work in the lab and, and get that experience. And um, it's really commendable. She's also traveling around on the weekend to look at colleges and I wish her the best of luck there. I know she'll make a great decision. She has a lot going for her. Um, we also took the tact of trying to develop a brand new assay here in lab with Jenna. So we handed her a novel project that hadn't been tested. And so we had to develop an assay um, basically from scratch and carry it all the way through. And she participated at every, at every um, point along the way there. And she really pushed us to get this assay um, developed. We had some problems and we all troubleshooted the problems. And that was a great example of science. So um, we really thank you. You pushed us into a new area and we got some really exciting results. So um, that's great credit to you. And we've designated Jenna as a future B cell biologist. So we hope that one day, although she is currently very interested in medical school, that perhaps she'll Purdue, uh, pursue MD PhD or maybe um, the echoes of B cell biology will stick with her and she'll come back to that. Um, so Ayana, if you have anything to say, you also were her co-mentor, so you can say something if you'd like. All of, I echo all of those points. Jenna did a, re, a great job um, in the lab. We're doing some really complex things. So she was a good sport and participated in all of the parts um, to this project. So Jenna, go ahead and I'm um, sure what you found. Okay. Thank you guys so much for the introduction. So hello everyone. Again, my name is Jenna Trent and I have the honor of working with Ian McFawn, Tulia Bruno, um, Ayana Ruffin, and Cheryl Cunning on conducting research on the effect of Basati's fluid on B cell phenotypes and function in ovarian cancer. So ovarian cancer is the foremost cause of gynecological cancer death and is overall one of the most frequent causes of fatal malignancy in women. In ovarian cancer, the symptoms are often nonspecific, hampering early detection, so the majority of patients present with advanced stage disease. 
It is evident that ovarian cancer is a multiplicity of distinct malignancy, such as high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which was the focus of my project. High-grade serous ovarian cancer, as mentioned, is a subtype of ovarian cancer, which is the most aggressive and malignant form of ovarian cancer. It is shown that it accounts for up to 70% for all ovarian cancer cases. Looking at the graph on the right, we can see that high grade has a lower overall survival than compared to the low grade ovarian cancer. So the immune system can both limit and promote cancer development. Therefore, it's critical to study the effects of various immune cells, such as B cells, on patients that suffer from HGSOC. B cells are a type of lymphocyte um, that are responsible for the humoral immunity through their capacity of antibody production. Antigens are recognized by the B cell receptor, and upon first antigen encounter, naive mature B cells are turned into activated B cells, which are capable of proliferation and differentiation. When B cells differentiate into plasma cells, plasma cells will start secreting antibodies. This process is crucial because they will coat tumor cells, which allows other immune cells like natural killer cells and macrophages to recognize and attack the tumor cells. Antibody responses are more vigorous and dominated by the production of immunoglobin antibodies, such as IgG, IgA, and IgM, which were measured in my project. Along with naive cells, memory B cells are vital to the immune response, as they are able to remember the same pathogen for faster antibody production. Likewise, some of them will live into the long-lived antibody producing cells. So when patients are diagnosed with such a progressive disease, such as HGSOC, patients will develop a fluid in their abdomen called um, ascites fluid. The presence of ascites correlates with the peritoneal spread of ovarian cancer and is associated with poor patient prognosis. If you look at the graph on the left, it shows ascites as a predictor of ovarian malignancy. Um, looking at the highlighted portion of the table, the study shows that in the presence of ascites, it most commonly occurs in a stage four of ovarian cancer. And from the study, we know that ascites will 100% occur in the advanced course of the disease. However, we can determine that when B cells are present in the tumor of HGSOC, we can conclude that patient survival and patient prognosis is better. Um, looking at the graph on the right, which is a Kaplan-Meier measuring survival analysis of patients um, based on whether their tumor contains different types of immune cells, we can see the red line on the graph shows the worst survival as it contains no tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. If you look at the green line at the top of the graph, which contains plasma cells and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, we notice that it shows the best overall survival. Therefore, the presence of plasma cells with B cells gives superior prognostic benefit to high-grade serous ovarian cancer patients. Given that ascites fluid is a predictor of HGSOC, it is valuable and critical that we study the effects um, it has on B cell function. Um, we can further determine that in the presence of ascites, if the B cells will produce antibodies or differentiate into plasma cells. So the experimental approach of my project was conducted in three major parts. Um, by conducting my experiment, we followed the protocol for um, B cell antibody secretion and differentiation. Our time stands for the project were on day four and day seven. The first step of the experiment was receiving lymph nodes, healthy donor blood, and ascites fluid. Um, we proceeded by collecting the, mem the memory cells, which were um, CD27 positive from the lymph node, and the naive cells, um, which are CD27 negative from the healthy donor blood. Um, we then separated the cells to help better narrow down the B cells to be a more specific cell populations that would make them better respond um, to the simulation. Um, there's a greater population of memory cells in the lymph node than compared to the naive cells. So the separation of the cells um, was critical, which which allowed us um, to better determine if the effect of the CITES fluid um, was on a specific B cell subtype. So following the separation, we had to plate and simulate the B cells. Um, to begin this procedure, we sterilized the CITES fluid to decrease the risk of contamination, and we proceeded with making the simulation cocktail. Um, for the simulation cocktail of the naive and memory cells, we used a two-step differentiation protocol at the indicated time points. Um, we used the activation cocktail for day zero and the plasma blast cocktail for day four. We simulated the cells using um, various antibody markers and interleukins. Um, these three agents are cru crucial for survival, function, activation, and the differentiation of B cells into plasma, plasma cells and secreting. Um, we proceeded to plate the cells using a 96-well plate. 
and to increase interaction amongst the cells and added theocytes fluid to the appropriate wells and began an incubation process for four days. Our last step of the protocol was measuring B cell differentiation using flow cytometry and measuring antibody production using ELISA. Unfortunately, we were um, experiencing some technical difficulties with the ELISA during our second roundup experiment, so we weren't able to include um, this data. However, um, we were able to collect the supernatant from day four and day seven and proceed with stating um, the cells. And during the day four and day seven time points, we checked for cells under the microscope to see if they had expanded at least three times or start proliferating um, around day two and day three, in which clusters would begin to form. Um, I should also mention, given the results from previous experiments, we had to optimize a few steps to our procedure, one of which in our initial experiment, we learned that most of our B cells had died. So to prevent this from occurring again, we have we decide to expand our panel um, to C27, C28, CD130, 38, and CD20. And we also filter, um, filter sterilize the societies to fluid to decrease the risk of contamination. And lastly, we change the concentration of a society's fluid from a one to one ratio to a one to 10 ratio. So as mentioned on day four, we measured the B cells, uh, memory B cells from the lymph node and the naive B cells from health healthy donor blood using the flow cytometry to determine if the cells um, have become more activated. So moving from left to right, the first graph in the orange is the naive B cells. Um, this is before we put them in the assay. In the pre-assay, we are checking for the purity of the cells. Following the pre-assay is the media highlighted in blue, and this is where we cultured the cells in the simulation cocktail as mentioned um, in the previous slide. And lastly, the red culture contains the cytes fluid. And this culture um, contains the same simulation cocktail, we just added this size fluid um, using the one to 10 ratio. So furthermore, we use the gating strategy highlighted in the second quadrant of each graph to select C19 positive and C20 positive B cells. Our day four analysis of B cell activation shows that in the presence of a size fluid, B cells are getting more activated as compared to the media. Um, we can determine our result by looking at the naive B cells seen in the top, seen in the top row. Um, the naive B cells are have become 36.5% active as compared to the media only becoming 13.1% activated. And if you look at the memory B cells as seen in the bottom row, we can determine that 86.3% of the memory cells are becoming um, activated in society's fluid as compared to the media only becoming 51.9% activated. So the data shows that in the presence of ascites, B cells are able to reach a high activation rate, which will help them to differentiate um, into plasma cells or plasma blasts. And this ultimately shows us that when B cells are present in ascites fluid of ovarian cancer, it may ultimately help promote their function activation. Sorry. Okay, so at day seven, we measured the memory B cells from the lymph node using the flow cytometry to determine if the cells had differentiate different differentiating to plasma blast. Um, we gated on CD19 positive, CD20 negative, and CD27 high, and CD38 high cells. Um, we are using KI67 and CD138 to define plasma blasts and plasma cells. So the naive B cells have such a high increase of activation that they did not differentiate into plasma cells. Um, the green highlighted boxes indicate plasma blasts KI67 and the first quadrant of the graph, and the purple highlighted boxes indicate plasma cells CD138 and the fourth quadrant of the graph. If you look at ascites one, two, and three, we can determine that plasma cell formation and differentiation has occurred. Um, we can see more plasma cells in the presence of ascites fluid than, again, compared to the media. The data shown is fairly interesting because plasma cell differenti differentiation would normally take 10 days um, to get to plasma cells and additional cocktail, but instead our data shows that it took only seven days to reach plasma cell formation. Um, given our results, it suggests to us that there is something in the size fluid that is rapidly creating plasma cell formation to occur, and therefore it's important to further investigate and research um, what's exactly in a size fluid. So to conclude my experiment in B cell activation, we know is that the excites fluid um, increased activation of memory in naive B cells. And for differentiation, we measured, um, we noticed that in the presence of ascites fluid, it promoted memory B cell to differentiate into CD138 plasma cells. So overall, this data shows that ascites fluid is able to activate and differentiate plasma cells, which will ultimately help increase patient survival for a patient that suffers from ovarian cancer. And furthermore, it's crucial that further research be done to address the effects of ascites 
Chinese fluid on B cell phenotypes and function. Given our data from prior experiments, it's important to address and research antibody production in a size fluid. This would include detecting antibodies and looking at the function of antibodies in ovarian cancer. And lastly, it's crucial to examine the size fluid by, by understanding in greater detail how size promotes the cells to differentiate into plasma cells or become um, activated so quickly. Lastly, from my acknowledgments, I want to give a huge thank you to the Hillman Academy, including um, Dr. David Boone and Solomon for giving me this amazing opportunity. And I also like to thank some key collaborators and resources um, for providing us with the equipment to conduct my experiment. And last but not least, I would like to thank the entire Bruno Labs, which is Tulia, uh, Ian, Ion, and Cheryl for helping me and supporting me throughout um, this entire research project. So thank you. Great job, Jenna. Does anybody have any questions? Jenna, that was super uh, clear, a very, very clear presentation and um, really cool data. Quick question for you. Um, so it was actually pretty remarkable, right, that, um, that B cells exposed to ascites fluid, which is generally considered to be like immunosuppressive, actually promoted the activation of the B cells. That was really cool. So um, what about their survival? Did they live in this ascites fluid or did you get fewer B cells at the end? Um. I'm, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure yet, but um, I'm sure um, Ian or Ayana can answer that because I haven't been in the lab since a few days, so. It's okay. Yeah, um, so the, the cells actually do survive. Um, the, the naive B cells did pretty good um, at, at day seven. The memory B cells, because they are getting so activated, they kind of did die a little bit toward at the day seven time point. So, um, and some of the flu is not all of them. So we did six different patients. Some of them, they did a little bit better than others. So oh. they, are, they are surviving. The, the viability is pretty good. And you can, because each step requires you to move forward and add do more stems. So you, you are getting some good um, survival there. Yeah, it's really cool data. That's really, ex that's really exciting. We did have to titrate back the concentration. At one to one, they were not very happy. We went down to a one to 10 dilution. So. That may have helped them as well, just keeping them somewhat happy, but giving them some of the stim in the in the ascites as well. Yeah, definitely an untapped uh, uh, you know way to study um, cancer immunology is the ascites fluid. Very interesting. Anyone else? If not, we will move on to Daniel Levin in the laboratory of Dr. Greg Delgoff. All right, um, it is my uh, distinct pleasure uh, to be able to introduce uh, Daniel who, um, uh, you know, who worked in our lab as a, a first timer to the Hillman Academy. Um, he came in, um, you know, really excited about uh, working with us. And so while, while Daniel was quiet, he was always in the lab. He was a very hard worker. Um, he really thought extensively about uh, the questions that, that we're asking. Um, and, and because of those two things together, the result was like pretty phenomenal data for a, um, for, uh, for a, a summer student. Um, it's been uh, really exciting to to, you know, to watch uh, watch his project kind of grow and, and and him learn how to do stuff um, in the laboratory. So a lot of things that we do in the lab is growing T cells. Um, we take T cells, which we can use to see tumor cells. We can grow them in vitro. Um, and uh, and uh, Daniel's project was understanding how cancer cells change the way that T cells can grow. And he's going to be sharing some of those data with you today. But uh, knowing about his passion for for gardening and his ability to grow grow uh, T cells in, in culture, uh, um, and, and is really very good at growing T cells in culture, we, um, we're, we're giving him the title as the green thumb for T cells. Um, and so I wanted to say thanks before I want before he starts, I want to say thanks for for being with us in the lab. And I also can't thank enough. Um, his his direct mentor, um, Jeremy Wong, who who uh, who is a, a Tsinghua scholar in the laboratory, as well as um, uh, a research assistant professor in my lab, Diana Riva um, who uh, who was also overseeing him. So Daniel, go ahead and take it away. Thanks for the introduction. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, so 
My project was on tumor cystoplegia, and we found that it desensitized CD8 T cells to TCR stimulation. Starting out with some background, CD8 T cells. that indicate dysfunction within a cell. And T cells on the surface of T cells that uh, interact with the MFHC1 peptide. The peptide more and it also increases the production of cytokines, which are singularly poor IL-2, it's the cytokine that can help its cell growth. The cells then directed to the site of infection by trafficking molecules and affect their CD8 T cells, release perforins, then make holes in the membranes that target cells, and also release Hey, hey, Daniel, we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Studies have shown that there's a limited amount of nutrients and low metabolite level. Okay, do you want me to speak up or? Um, like, no, no, it's it's actually your internet connection. Try turning off your video. That usually helps um, when you're just delivering audio, and we'll turn you back on afterwards. All right, let's give that a try. Okay. Um, so this lack of nutrients, can you hear me now? Yep, much better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, negatively impacts T cell function, and this includes decreased proliferation, low cytotoxic capability, and reduced um, cytotoxic function. So in the lab, we are interested in looking at how different metabolites okay, can affect T cell function. And we wanted to use an in vitro model to address this question. So in collaboration with the Muir lab, they developed an in vitro model of tumor interstitial fluid media. And this is how uh, the media is made. So first a tumor was taken out of the mouse and spun to isolate tumor interstitial fluid. And then plasma is also collected. Then through liquid chromatography, the differences in metabolite levels were identified. And these metabolite levels are then used to formulate a TIF media that can be easily made again and again. And so we wanted to look further into some of the metabolites that could be affecting CD8 T cell function. So phosphorylethanolamine or P10 is one of those metabolites that's found to be enriched in tumor interstitial fluid media by the Delgoff lab. And it was found to affect T cell function. And so previously it's known that P10 is a molecule involved in phospholipid synthesis, but not much else is known about the ways in which it impacts T cells. So preliminary data from the Delgoff lab, including my mentor Jeremy, shows that when cells are cultured in nutrient-rich media with the addition of P10, it was found that these cells had increased proliferation compared to cells cultured in just nutrient-rich media, but the lack of cytokine production that's associated with cells cultured in the TIF media could not be restored. However, this data was from cells that were re-stimulated with one concentration of CD3 antibodies, and those um, were responsible for activating the cell and creating this cytokine production. And that was only three micrograms per mil. And so what my project focuses on is how the sensitivity to stimulation via the T cell receptor that we talked about earlier is affected when the cells are cultured in TIF media and also media with P10. And so to do this, we needed to do a titration of stimulatory molecules to get a full picture of how T cell sensitivity to TCR activation changes when the cells are cultured in different media. So this is how we set up the experiment. The cells were first cultured in three different medias. So we have uh, R10, which is nutrient-rich media containing hormones and growth factors that are necessary for in vitro cell culture. And then there's also R10 plus P10, which is our nutrient-rich media with the addition of phosphorylethanolamine, which is the metabolite enriched in TIF. And then lastly, there's tumor interstitial fluid media or TIF media, which is, which is nutrient depleted. So OT1 cells are first isolated from the mouse and then activated with synfecal, which is a synthetic peptide that is specific to the T cell receptors on these cells. And then after activation, the cells are placed into one R10 culture. Then on day two, the cells are separated into different media. So we have our R10, R10 plus P10, and TIF media. Then on day seven, the cells are re-stimulated via the T cell receptor. And how this is done is through those CD3 antibodies that we talked about earlier. 
and so they bind to the CD3 protein complexes on the T-cell receptor that help to transmit the signal from the cell membrane into the nucleus. And this re-simulation with the CD3 antibodies is done at different concentrations. So the same amount of cells are put into each amount. So we have 0, 1, 3, 5, 10, and 25 micrograms per milliliter. So that's 18 different conditions total. And then co-stimulatory molecules are added uh, to complete the re-stimulation process. Then the cytokines within the cells are stained for using fluorescent antibodies. And the signal is picked up using flow cytometry that measures the cytokine production. Now onto the results of the experiment. So this slide shows tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon gamma cytokine, cytokine production. And tumor necrosis factor or TNF can promote inflammation and is responsible for many signaling events that can help with apoptosis and interferon can help communicate that there are cancer cells in the body and trigger an immune response. So looking at the figures on the right, we can visualize the changes in cytokine production. And each dot represents a cell um, and the figures that represent immunofluorescence of the cells that go through the machine. So quadrant two represents the TNF and IFN double positive cells. And that's the quadrant we wanna focus on, quadrant two. So with um, our 10 cells, the double positive population is well-defined even at one microgram per mil and does change a lot at 25 microgram per mil. But on the other hand, the double positive population of TIF media cells is less well defined at one microgram per mil, but becomes much more clear when we get to our 25 microgram per mil. But P10 stays lower and isn't really able to catch up. So with the line graph on the left, the Y axis is the double positive populations that expressing these higher amounts of TNF and IFN that correlates to Q2 in these figures. And the gates that divide them are superficial and serve as a way to distinguish between the different populations of cells and also compare from graph to graph. So the X axis here is the amount of C3 antibodies that the cells are re-stimulated with in microgram per mil. And no cytokine production is observed at zero microgram per mil of anti-CD3 because these cells do not get the stimulatory signal necessary for the production of these cytokines. P10 and TIF media cells seem to be less sensitive to the smaller amounts of anti-CD3 than the R10 cells, and this trend continues throughout the titration. P10 and TIF media cells start out with similar production, but then TIF media cells are a bit more sensitive than the P10 cells, and their production picks up and is able to match that of R10 cells. But P10 production stays lower until about 5 and 25 microgram per mil, where then it is no longer statistically um, different from R10. Here we see IL-2 and granzyme B production. So on the y-axis, we have the amount of IL-2 production seen through MFI or mean fluorescent index, which is the amount of fluorescent signal the flow cytometry machine uh, picks up from the antibodies. So zero microgram per mil of anti-CD3 yielded around the same amount of IL-2 production for all the cells here, meaning that um, IL-2 production might not be affected by the different conditions that we have the cells cultured in. And then we have an expected climb in IL-2 production, but we see a similar trend here that we did with um, TNF and IFN, where P10 and TIF media cells are a bit less sensitive. But here, P10 cells seem to have more similar production capabilities as the TIF media cells, and their production becomes increasingly closer to those of R10 and is no longer significant for P10 at the highest concentrations. In granzyme B, we can see the production stays the same throughout the titration. And this is because granzyme B production is not necessarily de dependent on TCR activation, but is preformed within the cells. And so P10 cells have less granzyme B production than R10, but it's not significantly different. And then on the other hand, TIF media cells do have lower granzyme B production throughout the titration besides this three microgram per mil, meaning that the lack of nutrients does have a large effect on the cell's ability to produce this molecule. So in conclusion, as expected, with our higher amounts of CD3 antibodies, there was more uh, cytokine production, but cells cultured in P10 had a bit less production than R10 cells. But with 25 microgram per mil and the other highest concentrations of anti-CD3, TIF media cells had the same level of cytokine production as the cells cultured in R10. And when it came to granzyme B, TIF media cells had greatly reduced cap um, capability to produce this molecule. And so further directions include looking at mRNA levels of cytokines to further determine if the results are from differences in sensitivity to TCR stimulation or if it's from other factors. 
I'd like to send a big thanks to Jeremy for mentoring me throughout the summer. Thank you for being so patient with me and teaching me all of the lab techniques and explaining everything that we did. And I really appreciate all of the time you put in. Thank you to Dr. Diana Rivandira and Greg Delgoff for letting me do research in your lab this summer, and Dr. Tamia Bruno, Diana Ruffin, and Ian McFarn for the research roundtable feedback. And lastly, I would like to thank Dr. David Boone and Solomon Lipschitz for organizing the Hybrid Homeland Academy program this year. And I really appreciate the opportunity to do this type of research. And so I want to say thank you. And that concludes my presentation. Great job, Daniel. Does anyone have a question? I have one thought, Daniel. Um, you do definitely show that there's a reduction in granzyme B in your T cells. I was curious if you guys have thought about maybe testing a cytotoxicity assay to see if the T cells that are cultured with the TFIM, if they're less um, proficient at killing tumor cells. Are you guys able to do that in your lab or maybe that's a future direction? Yeah, I think there have been some killing assays that have been done, but I think Jeremy has more to say about that. Yeah, we did do a killing assay with cells cultured from R10 CIF media and R10 plus P10. And the cells cultured in CIF media, they do have less killing when the cells are co-cultured with C16 over. And before the cells cultured in R10 plus P10, the situation is more complex. It, like, it varies in terms of how the cells are getting activated, getting re-stimulated. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, no one else has more questions. We'll move on to our next presenter, which is Kieran Nazarali in the laboratory of Dr. Jishnu Das. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. So I'm delighted to introduce Kiran Nazarali, who's actually a second time Hillman scholar. So she came through the same program and was in my lab last year too. And Kiran has been an absolutely fantastic addition to the lab. So she just finished high school, graduated at the top of her class as valedictorian. Uh, she, in fact, even received an award from the governor of Georgia uh, for her academic accomplishments. We were absolutely delighted to have someone as talented as her in the lab. And she will actually, beyond the program, continue to work in the lab, even though she'll be an undergrad at Georgia Tech as a remote undergrad researcher. I mean, when I started the lab, I never envisioned that I would even have someone like that, but because Kiran is so talented and she's contributed so much to the project, uh, she will continue working in the lab. So uh, Kiran is really a machine learning expert in the making. I mean, uh, she's just finished high school, but the depth of her mathematical training already at this level has enabled her to delve into these complex uh, computational approaches. And she'll talk more about her project, so I won't steal her thunder, but uh, we were really, really excited to have Kiran in the lab. So the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for the um, introduction, Dr. Thus. So I will start. So the title of my project is Multivariate Metabolite Profiles are Significantly Discriminatory Between RF Positive C and CCP Positive and RF Positive CCP Negative RA. So I'll start with talking about what the current criteria to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis is. So this table is the 2010 American College of Rheumatology slash European Union League Against Rheumatism or 2010 ACR Euler criteria, which clinicians use to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. There are four um, main categories. The first is joint involvement, which is like the number and extent um, of joints involved. 
Uh, the second is serology, which is like uh, different autoantibodies that are um, positive after a blood test. B is some acute phase reactants. And then D is just how long the symptoms have been occurring. And based on each of these symptoms, uh, points are denoted based on each of them. And a score of six or greater uh, means that the patient likely has rheumatoid arthritis. So we're interested in the category of serology. So when you take a blood test, um, two of the different autoantibodies that we look for when diagnosing for rheumatoid arthritis is RF, which stands for rheumatoid factor, and ACPA, which stands for anti peptide antibody. And I'll also mention CCP as well. So if a patient um, does not is negative for both RF and ACPA or CCP, we classify them as seronegative. But if a patient is positive for RF, uh, CCP, or even both, we classify them as seropositive. Um, so the purpose of this project is to understand the molecular differences between the seropositive RA. So um, this one to the right, RF negative, uh, CCP positive, uh, there were a few patients who were this in our cohort, which we studied, and also it is relatively rare. So we focused on uh, the differences between RF positive and CCP negative RA, and then RF positive and CCP positive RA. And uh, previous literature has also indicated that RF positive, CCP positive RA has increased disease severity and inflammation. And then just more information about the cohort. It's uh, called the RACER cohort, which is an NIH-funded cohort, and the data was shared by Dana Ashman and Larry Moreland. In addition to that, this, um, this is actually part of a larger project um, occurring in our lab. And actually, there's also another undergrad. Her name is Leanne, who was working um, also between these two RA endotypes. But instead of molecular, she was looking at the genetic differences between both of them. So last summer, I also worked on this project where I was investigating metabolite profiles between these two RA endotypes. But um, I was looking at univariate analysis and trying to see if there are any univariate differences. So I found last summer that the univariate differences between RF positive and CCP positive and RF positive and CCP negative metabolite profiles were small. So that motivates a, the, a more of a multivariate approach instead of a univariate approach, which is um, what I used this year. So this is a schematic of um, my project. So first I had the metabolite and serology data, and I use uh, different prediction techniques. The first is lasso, which is used for feature selection. And then after the features are selected, I use uh, an SVM model and a random forest model. And I'll talk a little bit more about these later as well. Then um, two, uh, two sort of outcomes the first we could do is outcome prediction. So we wanna see how well can we can the metabolites uh, predict if the patient is RF positive, CCP positive, <laughs> RF positive and CCP negative. And the second is if we can figure out if there are any biomarkers. Then figure V is just a little bit more information about the data set. So we have 175 DI identified samples. We have the metabolites and serology and there are five different time points. So um, for the purposes of um, this presentation, we focused on pre-dose and um, the post-dose time point. So um, first I'll discuss about lasso. So um, as part of this equation, this is the residual sum of squares, and then this is a tuning parameter uh, times the sum of the absolute value of the betas. So what lasso does is it has a penalty that shrinks the coefficients. And when some of the coefficients are shrunk, that um, some of them can be shrunk to zero, which enables like feature selection. So some of the features can be eliminated. So what can happen is if we have very high coefficients, we can have a lot of noise and as well as something known as overfitting, which means that it, the model works really well on the data set, which is given, but not so well if you introduce some uh, new data, it's too specific to that trained data set. So what we're trying to do is find the minimal number of features that achieves the best prediction performance. So we use lasso to determine which features are we going to use in the um, model. And the first one that um, I used was an SVM, which stands for a support vector machine. And what um, SVM does is it uses a hyperplane to uh, separate two classes. And in this case, the two classes are RF positive and CCP positive and RF positive and CCP negative. It's similar to um, SVM, how we use the lasso selected features and use those in the SVM model. We also um, use the lasso selected features in an RF model. And RF also separates into two classes, but it does it a little bit differently. 
and parts of the data are used to make decision trees. And the leaf node or um, the last node is the uh, predicted result. So out of all these um, different decision trees that Random Forest uses, um, all the predicted results are average, and that is the predicted um, result for, that is determined by Random Forest. So um, as I mentioned, the lasso selected feature is used for an SVM model and lasso selected features are used for the random forest. So why is there a, a distribution? The reason for that is, is we use something known as leave one out cross validation. And in leave one out cross validation, we hold out one sample and we use the model on the rest of the data. And then we train on that um, sample that's held out. And um, then we do this uh, multiple times and have multiple replicates. And the reason for this is this is an unbiased way of evaluating the model performance. And then on the y-axis, we have uh, something called AUC, which stands for area under the receiver, receiver operating curve, um, which is like a measure of accuracy. So 1.0 is like the one is like the best, while 0.5 is about random. Then uh, we also, in addition to the actual, uh, we also have uh, permuted. So what permuted is, is that we take like the data set and then the outcome, we shuffle the outcome, like the RF positive, CC positive, and essentially we have a random data set that serves as a negative control. So it's used to compare um, with the actual data set. So um, this is for uh, SVM and RF. And as you can see, the median of the actual is much higher than the median of the permuted. And the p-value is less than 0 0.01, which means both of these models uh, significantly discriminate between RF positive and CC positive and RF positive and CC negative at the pre-dose um, time point. So we also um, did this at the post-dose um, time point, but what we saw is that the lasso SVM and lasso RF model did not discriminate um, between them. So some of the uh, lasso selected features, um, or which are the metabolites that were um, here are the box fossil bellows. So um, blue stands for the RF positive and CCP negative, and green stands for RF positive and CCP positive. So as you can see for X2 hydroxy nirvana, the median of the RF positive and CCP positive is higher than the median of the RF positive and CCP negative. And then for these three, cysteine as sulfate and acetyl tyrosine orthanine, um, the median of the RF positive and CCP negative is higher than the median of the RF positive and CCP positive. So those four uh, lasso selected features um, or metabolites that I showed you are also um, biomarkers. And we also perform partial least squares discriminatory analysis on those. So the um, x-axis is latent variable one and the y-axis is latent variable two. And latent variable essentially is, is like um, a combination of all those four features, uh, which best describes the covariance between the outcome and the metabolite. So as you can see, the orange is RF positive and CCP negative, and the blue is RF positive and CCP positive. As we can see, there's two distinct um, groups. Um, above the line is RF positive and CCP positive, and below is RF positive and CCP negative. So um, overall, we've seen that the lasso SVM and lasso RF models um, significantly discriminate between RF positive and CCP positive and RF positive and CCP negative in the pre-dose visit, but not as well in the post-dose visit. This means that these differences appear to be modulated by the treatment. So a further direction would be understanding why and how, how is it exactly modulated? And if we can do and understand how it's modulated, then what we could do is that at the baseline, um, we could be able to take the metabolite profiles and be able to have tailored and individualized treatment regimen. So I wanted to thank Dr. Das and Dr. Rahman for all of their support and giving me the opportunity to work, work in the lab, as well as um, all the lab members, um, the NIHES program, and the, um, the people who shared the RACER cohort, and then Dr. Boone Solomon, and all the members of the Hillman Academy and the ICI site. Thank you so much. Great job. We have a couple minutes for questions.
So I guess I have a question about um, your model. Is this something that you imagine could eventually be brought into the clinical setting to maybe do some sort of a blood test or something to help identify patients that would likely fall into one category or another to help inform treatment? Or um, how do you envision your model uh, contributing to patient care down the line? That's a great question. I think uh, first we should understand um, first uh, definitely more information on how exactly the treatment is modulating um, and modulating this. And then, yes, uh, we could, if we understand exactly what's happening, maybe we could take like the metabolite like profiles at um, probably the baseline or the predose and then be able to determine what treatment could help be benefit um, the patient based on um, maybe like the blood test or the type of RA that they have. Yeah, great. Uh, any other questions? Okay, if not, we'll move on to Graciela Leon in the laboratory of Dr. Robert Ferris. Hello, uh, this is Lazar Vujanovic. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being Graciela's uh, mentor past couple of months. Um, so firstly, uh, let me start off by saying that uh, Graciela is the best high school student I've mentored to date. Now I've only mentored two high schoolers, but you know, she's definitely the best. Um, so she's about to start her junior year at the Pittsburgh Creative and Performing Arts School, and she's a violinist and an inventor. You should check out her uh, YouTube video. And um, that's a testament to her creativity. Um, also, she's highly inquisitive and loves natural sciences, especially chemistry, which are all traits of a good scientist. Now, as a violinist, she uh, loves classical music like Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich, and apparently ABBA. And um, also she's a Star Wars fan, which really helps when you have to work with a person like me. Um, so I put Graciela on a tricky project that deals with the resistance mechanisms to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors. And this is in the context of BRAF mutated melanomas. And from day one, Graciela showed high interest in her project and she grabbed the bull by the horns and with high degree of enthusiasm, um, as well as competency and efficiency, she was able to generate uh, the data that she will show you. Now, as such, Graciela has earned the title of B, parentheses, RAF major. Um, it's much funnier if you actually look at it on a piece of paper. In any case, so without further ado, uh, here's Graciela, and the title of her presentation is TNF Receptor 2 Expression on B, RAF Mutated Melanomas, mediates TNF-driven resistance to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors. Take it away. All right, thank you for the introduction. That was great. So you already know the title of my project. Um, just to get into some background. So while melanoma is not the most common form of skin cancer, it is the most aggressive and has the highest potential to metastasize. 50% of melanomas harbor activating BRAF mutations um, that are, um, and they become not dependent on proliferative signals, which leads to uncontrolled uh, cell growth and cell proliferation, um, and ultimately to the development of cancer. So this occurs through the fact that the receptor tyrosine kinase is not dependent on proliferative signals. Small molecule BRAF and MEK inhibitors have been developed to target this mitogen activated protein kinase or MAP kinase signaling pathway in um, BRAF lesions and they're approved as standards of care here shown in red. However, the development of a safe and effective uh, MAP kinase cascade targeting therapy capable of promoting extended and progression-free survival in melanoma patients has been limited by a range of resistance mechanisms. Now this resistance um, may be directly induced by TNF or tumor necrosis factor um, released by tumor associated microphages. So the cytokine tumor necrosis factor can circumvent pathway inhibitors 
um, blocking apoptosis and allowing for continuous cell proliferation and survival. It does this through multiple pathways, including the NF-kappa B and MAP kinase pathway. So TNF is produced as two structurally and functionally different forms, soluble TNF, which primarily signals uh, through TNF receptor one expressed on all um, cells and less commonly through TNF receptor two, which is uh, expressed primarily on immune cells. TNF or the transmembrane form of TNF signals via TNF receptor two. So receptors one and two activate distinct signaling pathways. However, they both play a role in mediating cell proliferation and survival as well as inflammation. So previous literature had suggested that um, all BRAF mutated cell lines when it exposed to TNF could acquire uh, resistance to BRAF and MEK inhibitors. So on that basis, it was demonstrated that some cell lines like SK melanoma line 37, which expresses TNF receptor 2, um, could respond favorably to anti-TNF treatments. Uh, but other cell lines like melanoma line 28, which does not express TNF receptor 2, couldn't respond at all. So following simulation um, with TNF, or TNF um, cell line 37, as you can see here, lost a significant amount of sensitivity to both uh, BRAF and MEK inhibitors. And when DNTNF selective inhibitors and anti-TNF antibody treatment was applied, the sensitivity increased. Whereas in melanoma line 28, uh, the sensitiv sensitivity levels were fairly consistent. Um, Looking at TNF receptor 1 and receptor 2 expression as a possible reason for this, um, it was observed that um, higher expression of TNF receptor 2 correlates with enhanced ability of certain cell lines to acquire resistance to these pathway inhibitors. So um, this figure shows SK melanoma line 37 variants that had TNF receptor one and receptor two knocked out so that we could look at their sensitivity to TNF induced resistance to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors. Then these results were compared to the wild type or unmodified versions, which express both receptors. And um, what we see here is that when TNF receptor one or receptor two are knocked out, uh, the cell line's ability to acquire resistance to inhibitors is abrogated. So just for some context, out of single cell melanoma suspensions derived from BRAF metastatic lesions in 14 patients um, evaluated for TNF expression by flow cytometry, half of them um, expressed TNF receptor 2. So the goal of this research is a continuation of previous studies aimed at investigating the role of TNF receptor 2 and soluble TNF-driven resistance to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors and its expression in BRAF mutant melanoma. So to do this, it was necessary to generate receptor 2 knock-in uh, variants of the SK melanoma 28 cell line using transvection, then examine their sensitivity to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors through an MTT killing assay, and then evaluating receptor expression and NF-kappa B phosphorylation uh, by way of flow cytometry. So for these, exper ex for these experiments, uh, we used an unmodified or wild type and TNF receptor 2 variants of the SK melanoma 28 cell line. And once confirmed the status of a stably transfected cell line expressing TNF receptor 2 um, through flow cytometry staining, I applied um, in vitro treatments with recombinant human TNF. Finally, um, we used an MTT killing assay to um, examine the, the sensitivity of the cell lines to both BRAF and MEK inhibitors. And the MTT assay allowed us to measure the metabolic activity in order to understand the cytotoxicity or effectiveness of these um, inhibitors. So uh, I analyzed the measured color intensity data from the MTT killing assay on the um, wild type variant, which as you can see here from this flow cytometry data, didn't express any TNF receptor 2 and then the TNF receptor 2 expressing variant. So observing the wild type uh, variant of the SKML28, we saw that, um, we saw again that when treated with TNF, uh, these cell lines that don't express receptor 2 uh, don't, res uh, don't acquire resistance to BRAF and or MAP inhibitor, and that's consistent with earlier data. Um, but in contrast, when we look at the TNF receptor 2 expressing variant, it showed increased ability to acquire resistance to both BRAF and MAC inhibitors. This cell line was also initially more uh, responsive to 
TNF treatments than the wild type. So this suggests that following pretreatment, the TNF receptor 2 um, expressing cell line acquired resistance to BRAF and MEK inhibitor mediated cell killing. So finally, we wanted to look at whether TNF induced resistance was mediated through the NF kappa B pathway, because this is a mechanism that has been previously reported to play a central role in the acquisition of resistance. So flow cytometry was used to measure NF kappa B phosphorylation. So when the wild type uh, cell line was stimulated with TNF, it showed increased phosphorylation of NF kappa B. And this can be attributed to its expression of receptor one. However, surprisingly in the TNF receptor two expressing variant, uh, there is no increase in NF kappa B phosphorylation. In fact, the presence of uh, the TNF receptor two variant uh, suppressed the NF kappa B pathway. And so th this is suggesting that uh, resistance in cell lines expressing uh, TNF receptor 2 occurs through a different pathway. Um, so just in summary from data from Dr. Lazar and that that I acquired this summer, uh, TNF receptor 2 was ex expression was detected on half of the BRAF melanoma cell lines and biopsies. Recombinant human TNF induced BRAF and MEK inhibitor resistance only in receptor one and TNF receptor two co-expressing BRAF melanoma cell lines. And TNF receptor two could be uh, essential to soluble TNF induced MAP kinase pathway inhibitor resistance and a possible biomarker for identifying melanoma patients that could benefit from TNF targeting therapies. So future directions um, would include examining how TNF receptor one and receptor two synergize in the soluble TNF driven resistance process, um, investigating which uh, TNF receptor two associated signaling pathways mediate resistance to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors if it isn't NF kappa B, and uh, determining whether TNF receptor two expression on melanomas is an intrinsic or acquired resistance mechanism to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors or both. Um, I wanted to thank my mentor, Dr. Zar, for always putting up with my questions and um, teaching me so much, as well as uh, Dr. Ferris and the Ferris Lab, including Aditi and Carly, who made me feel very welcome in the lab, and um, it was just such a great experience. I also wanted to thank the Hillman Academy program for providing me with this invaluable opportunity to do actual research. It's been really incredible, um, so thank you. Great job. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Do you guys have any idea of what other pathways could be evolved? in this process since it's not NF-kappa B, since we know NF-kappa B is a big regulator of cell growth and things like that. Um, do you guys have an idea or a, a hypothesis of what other pathways could be involved? Um, well, um, it's part of another, uh, I think that it, it could be mediated through the MAP kinase pathway. It's a sort of more complicated story that needs to be explored, especially in conjunction with this other protein a receptor that is involved um, in the process, CD271. Um, so yeah, that needs to be explored. Um, thanks. Um, what are the sources of tumor necrosis factor around a tumor? Is it coming from immune cells or is, is it coming from other tumor cells or how does that play into the different types of tumors that might be sensitive to TNF? Um, I, it's coming from the, like, the tumor microenvironment from the tumor associated microphages. It's produced. By Okay, great job. So I don't hear any other questions. So we'll move on to our final presenter today, which is Ramai Mulakudla in the laboratory of Dr. Turnquist. Thanks.
Uh, it's my real pleasure today to introduce Srimay. Srimay is a rising senior at Swickley Academy. And after she finishes up there, she plans to do um, pursue medicine by completing a BS MD program, ideally at Pitt, it sounds like. Um, besides maintaining perfect grades and really being involved and forming lots of clubs, she's been highly active in, in the Pennsylvania Junior Academy of Science, as well as competing at the NASTER Masters STEM competitions. And she also um, does classical Indian dance, which is um, really cool. I know she's highly involved in that as well. Srimay's so project has involved answering house and vesicles that in collaboration with um, Dr. Battleax group, we've been uh, um, characterizing and they've identified them in the extracellular matrix. And what Srimay's so project we've been looking at is to uh, see how these vesicles change during the progression disease pathology and how this, these then can impact on local immune cells. This has been really a historically challenging project in the lab and it's really given us a lot of frustration um, but Shreema, you know, she's super nice, super persistent, um, and she really has made some great um, and exciting findings recently, like in the last couple of weeks. Um, so this really has given me the impression that Shreema is not only super nice and smart, hard worker, but she also appears to be a little bit lucky. And so that is actually a really good trait in research is to be lucky sometimes. And so for this reason, we've awarded her the Lucky Vesicle Cracker Award for the great job and the finding she's uncovered about these vesicles this summer. And so whenever you're ready, Srime. Thank you, Dr. Kernquist, for that introduction. All right, so I'll just share my screen. All right, hi everyone. My name is Srime Mulukutla. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share our research on defining the functions of matrix bond vesicles on immune cells during heart failure. To get started, these are some of the findings that have been established with the Badalak lab. So the extracellular matrix is important for cell structure and communication. This ECM contains these matrix bound vesicles that have microRNA and proteins that help to modulate the function of macrophages, which are white blood cells after some sort of tissue injury. So these macrophages are important for mediating repair after an injury. And there are two types of immune responses for the macrophages. The first one is an M1 response, which is more pro-inflammatory and focused on clearing tissue damage and debris. If there is too much of this M1 response, it can lead to tissue damage itself. There are certain genes such as INOS that are more upregulated in these M1 or pro-inflammatory macrophages. And lipopolysaccharide and interferon gamma can activate macrophages towards this M1 or pro-inflammatory response. On the other hand, there is the M2 response, which is more reparative, anti-inflammatory, and focused on tissue repair. So CD206 and FIS1 are some of the genes that are more upregulated in these M2 macrophages, and interleukin-4 is able to activate macrophages towards this M2 response, which is more reparative. So these matrix bound vesicles are necessary for communication in the extracellular matrix. One of the things that has been previously established is that these matrix bound vesicles can skew or activate the macrophages towards this M2 response. So if you look at the figure here, um, you can focus on the last two boxes in the bottom row. These macrophages express a gene called arginase when exposed to a small intestinal MBV. And this expression pattern was similar to the macrophages that had been exposed to interleukin-4, which is expected to skew the macrophages towards an MG response. These specific matrix bound vesicles have also been shown to improve skeletal muscle repair and outcomes of eye injury. So for an overview of the project, cardiovascular complications can very often result from chemo and immunotherapy. So we know that the extracellular matrix is remodeled during heart disease and pathological remodeling of this extracellular matrix can lead to heart stiffness that leads to heart failure. One thing we don't know is if and how these vesicles are modified during the progression to heart failure. 
So in the project, we have tested the hypotheses that the transition to heart disease and failure is supported by the replacement of cardiac MBV with ones that are unable to direct the local effective repair uh, by the macrophages. This is a really important question as it can help understand the mechanisms behind the heart failure progression. So the first goal of the project is to assess the MBV isolated from clinical specimens, both failing and healthy hearts, to see if the MBV cargo changes significantly during the progression to heart failure. And the second goal is to see if the changes somehow support heart failure by causing any sort of pathogenic changes in the immune cell response that promote cardiac fibrosis. So the VMI cardiac tissue bank biospecimen study provided us with these human left ventricle samples from ischemic failing hearts and healthy hearts. And the matrix bound vesicles were isolated from those samples. So this is some of the preliminary data on the microRNA cargo of the MBV changes with the disease state. So on the left is a volcano plot of the expressed microRNA in the disease versus the healthy MBV. So the x-axis represents the log two conversion of the full change and the y-axis represents the log 10 conversion of the p-value. Essentially the microRNA with significant differential expression are in the bright blue. And on the right, we have the microRNA name, full change and p-value for some of the top differentially expressed microRNA. Essentially this data shows that there are specific microRNA that are more upregulated in healthy hearts or the failing hearts. And during the progression to heart failure, some microRNA expression goes up while others go down. So for the first study goal, five specific microRNA that were most upregulated in healthy or failing hearts were chosen. And we used the Applied Systems TACMAN advanced microRNA assays and followed the protocol in order to perform quantitative reverse transcriptase PCR for the microRNAs to assess the upregulation of these microRNAs in six samples of failing and six samples of healthy hearts. So for the first goal of the study, here are the results for the PCR for the microRNAs. These two specific microRNAs uh, labeled up here were more upregulated in failing hearts compared with the healthy ones. So the x-axis shows the data from the six samples of failing hearts and the y-axis shows the relative change compared with the healthy hearts. Essentially, this data clearly shows that microRNA 105P and microRNA 335 5P are more upregulated in the failing hearts, supporting our hypothesis. Now for the next experiment to address the second study, we plated these human macrophages, CD14 positive monocytes that we got from normal donor local packs from a blood bank. And we cultured these monocytes for seven days with macrophage colony stimulating factor. And then we added different stimuli to these macrophages to assess how they would respond to those various stimuli. So on the furthest left column, we added the MBV isolated from the failing hearts. For the middle column, we added the MBV isolated from the failing heart, and these six are the experimental wells. And on the right column, we have our controls. So for the negative control, we added media, which is made up of cytokines and glucose to the first well. Um, the second wall, we added lipopolysaccharide and interferon gamma to skew those macrophages towards the M1 response. And we added interleukin-4 in the last well to skew those macrophages towards the M2 response. So all of these on the rightmost column are the controls and the last two are the positive M1 and M2 controls that we'd be comparing the experimental wells to. And then we also performed RNA extraction and quantitative RT-PCR to assess the gene expression. We were just really interested in seeing whether there would be a difference in the immune response of the macrophages if they were exposed to the failing or healthy MBV. And we actually predicted that the healthy isolated MBV would skew those macrophages towards the M2 immune response, which is the more reparative one. Now, the next goal was to ask whether the MBV can skew the macrophages towards a certain type of response. So for both donor groups, the MRC1 gene is more heavily expressed in the M2 skewed macrophages with a 19-fold change over the untreated group for the first donor and a five-fold change over the untreated group for the second donor. So what's important here is that you can see that the macrophages that were exposed to the healthy MBV, which is shown by the blue dots over here, are 
sorry, the green dots over here, have a more significant full change over the untreated group, which is the negative control in the middle column, than the macrophages that were exposed to the failed MVV, which is the blue dot. So this data demonstrates how the macrophages that were exposed to the healthy MVV are skewing more towards an M2 response, which is what we had predicted. So these are the two important findings that have been found first by this project. So we have learned first that the MBV evolves during the progression to heart failure, as shown by the differences in the microRNA and proteins of the MBV isolator from the failing versus the healthy hearts. And next, we have learned that the MBV changes do have functional consequences on the macrophages that direct heart repair, and possibly if it can contribute to cardiac fibrosis if it is dysregulated. Um, in the future, further studies are hoping to be done to observe the effects of the two microRNAs that are more upregulated in the healthy hearts upon the macrophages. This can possibly be done by isolating the MBV from knockout mice that lack a particular gene, or by injecting those specific microRNA into the MBV and then assessing the immune response. But our observations so far lay an important foundation for these future experiments. So I'd like to give a huge thank you to Dr. Turnquist for being my mentor and for sharing his knowledge, experience, and advice on research. I'd also like to thank the research coordinator in the lab, Lisa Matthews, who really taught me how to do the experiments in the lab, who guided me through the research project. And I'd also like to thank the other people who provided us with the background info for this project and the materials to go about all the experiments. Thank you to Dr. Boone and Solomon Lipschitz for leading the program and helping us out with any questions. And I'd also like to thank Dr. McFawn, Ayuna Rufin, and Dr. Bruno and Dr. Delgoff for giving their advice on our presentations. And I'd just like to thank the Hillman Academy for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this rewarding experience. Thank you so much for listening. Great job, Srimi. Yeah, great job. Anyone have questions? I had one sort of hypothetical question about the different macrophage types in heart failure. Um, I think if I got this straight, you were saying that the more inflammatory macrophages contribute to fibrosis around the heart. I think that was what you were mentioning. Is, is it possible that if you could skew the macrophages into more of the anti-inflammatory uh, phenotype that they could potentially repair some of that damage? Is there any capacity for them to do that? Or would it just sort of be, you would stop further fibrosis? I think there is a possibility that it could help possibly repair it. Um, the reason why we wanted to look more into those specific microRNA that are more upregulated in the healthy hearts, we wanted to see if there's a potential to upregulate those specific microRNA in the hearts to either prevent future heart failure or even repair the current damage that might be happening due to the too much anti-inflammatory damage. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, looks like we don't have any more questions at this time. And I don't see anything accumulating in the chat from anybody. So um, I believe that was our last presenter. I think everybody went, correct? So we had um, seven presentations and uh, we finished up just about on time. Apologize again for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, but as far as Ayana and I are concerned, I think we say good job to everybody and thank you for the mentors who showed up and really solid and exciting presentations from anyone. So if any of the mentors have anything to say in conclusion, I think uh, we can take those remarks now. And if not, then the meeting can be adjourned. Yeah, I would just say from, you know, from the, in terms of you know, the Hillman Academy and, and, and the ICI program. And, and of course, all the mentors, we couldn't do this um, I, without, without all of the scientific mentors, both the heads of the labs, as well as the folks that are working in the labs. Um, this is an incredible opportunity in each of these people, just for, you know, just 
you know, just as a, a little piece of information, we don't get paid to do this. Um, you don't, the, the mentors don't get anything other than the ability to work with these fantastic scholars. Um, and, and, and not only uh, do we get to get to see how great they do during these, um, these little presentations, but we get to continue to watch how these folks do as they go on to college, as they go on to to graduate or medical or law school or whatever whatever they need whatever wherever they end up going. And the other thing I would just say to everyone is that mentors are not um, temporary. Mentors are for life. And so the people that men that are that your mentors here, you can always rely on whether or not you need advice, whether or not you need to just talk to somebody, whether or not you need a letter down the line. Um, it's amazing how many times I get request for letters from people that you know were in my lab you know five or six years ago and then and i look forward to being able to write those things so anyway um that's all i had to say so thanks everybody for coming i would say thanks to greg and tulia for organizing this i know as we've transitioned out of covid it's been you know trying to do it hybrid slash in the lab so i'm sure it's been twice as much work and uh it's really appreciated. It's a great program. And I know my lab enjoys having people in it. And, and you know, I think the students really enjoy it and you know benefit from it as well. So thanks to you. Oh, well, thank you for organizing this. This is, I mean, it's a pleasure to have such talented people. So I completely echo what you said. It's not for anything other than the privilege of working with such fantastic students. Yeah, and again, I also want to say thank you so much to Ian and Ayana for really just coming in and 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 being the boots on the ground for this. Um, Yatuli and I have been busier than we'd like to have admitted for this summer, um, but uh, it, it, we, Ian and, and Ayana really rocked out in taking a program, turning it into a very successful virtual program. And I think that the um, that the quality, the clarity of the presentations, it speaks to your guys' hard work. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. It's been a pleasure to work with all the students. I see bright futures for all of you and please keep in contact with us and let us know how you're doing um, in college. And if you wanna to go to grad school, if you wanna become a scientist, reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to help you guys on your paths. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. David and Solomon will not let you fall off the radar. They will be following you guys for updates uh, long after this. So I hope um, that you know you reach out as well. Thanks everybody. So I think we, do we need instructions for the future or no, are we good? That we're all going in on t at 2 p.m. over to the other one? Is that correct? I think that's correct. I think we have lunch okay. to go over. Okay, great. Thanks guys. I'm glad we were able to get this all sorted out. Yes, Tulia reached out. She's sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she texted me. She's like, oh yeah, so it's cool. All right. <laughs> all right, talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.